What I thought is share with you a couple of stats just to start off the conversation. Because we are, those of us who are STEM and are in a really good space, if you look at it, about it, the job growth overall of all industries is about 14%. For STEM, it's 19%. And you fast forward in 2018, all the stats say that 75% of the jobs will require some kind of skill and talent in STEM. So we're in a good place, all good and fine. However, what we'd like to focus on this particular session is how do we make sure that we get the job and the responsibilities that we want? There always can be a great opportunity, but not necessarily we get it. So we're gonna focus on a couple of key areas. One, we're gonna talk about stereotypes, good and bad. We're gonna talk about Superman, Superwoman. Those people in our career who've done great things for us, and those men and women who could have but didn't do great things. Because we want to look at both sides, because this is a very honest discussion we're having. And then the third point we're going to share with you is we're going to do a selfie. These ladies are gracious enough to share with you some insight on what they've learned, what they wish, to, wish they had done, their personal brand image. And so what I'd like each one of them to do is just take a few minutes to concisely kind of describe themselves around three or four key points. Their name, company, their overall responsibilities, how large is their department or organization in terms of how many and what's the percentage of women, how long they've worked in that role, and how did they come to the field of STEM. So let me start briefly. My background is I was an officer in a C-suite executive at a mobile applications company and 100% online company. And then I went and did a handful of jobs as vice president of IBM from product development, marketing sell, uh, sales, and eventually running a three and a half, four billion dollar business. And then I currently work for a company, I'm CEO president of a company, which specifically focuses, we had an enterprise SaaS group, and what we have now is the faster growing section, which helps companies improve their valuation leading to a liquidity event, M&A or IPO. So that's a little bit of background. So what I'd like to do is start on the far end and have each of the ladies tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Timmy. Hi, everyone. I'm Cheng Ya. I'm from Thomo Fisher Scientific, which is the largest life science company in the world. We have 50,000 employees across the globe in 50 countries. I'm in the product management function of its next-gen sequencing business. I have been with Thermo Fisher for three years. Uh, before Thermo Fisher Scientific, I practiced as a cardiologist and then became a senior scientist and worked in both biotech startups and large pharmaceuticals, and then became a chief strategist for uh, Pro State, uh, Proactive Healthcare uh, USA. Um, in average, in Thermo Fisher Scientific, I think we have about 30 to 35% of employees that are female. The reason I came to Stanfield traced back years ago when I Pra was practicing as a cardiologist. My mom, she got cancer and passed away. I deeply realized the limitation of clinical medicine. I believe the innovative research in biomedical science can help clinical medicine and people like my mom, they will, they will not die at a younger age. So, uh, since then, I pursued a PhD in biomedical science and become a, a, a researcher and a senior scientist, and then right now in the business side of life science industry ever since. It's a great pleasure to be here with all of you. Thank you. Lorna? Hi, I'm Lorna Bornstein. I am currently the founder and CEO of an online wellness video business called Grokker which I came out of retirement to start. Uh, I had started off my career as a lawyer. My mom's a judge, my dad's a lawyer. It's like the family business. <laughs> uh, and really hated it. 
And so we were trying to figure out, oh, how do I get out of that? I really love engineering, and I love tech, and I need to do that. And my husband and I were newly married. We had no money. And I couldn't go back to school. I'd already done an undergraduate degree in business and two law degrees. There was no more school for me in my books. I had to earn some money. Uh, and got some great advice from one of my mentors, which is go get hired by the most you know, prestigious law firm that has tech clients and get headhunted out of there. And I ended up doing that, and I got to HP. And HP in the early 90s was just an incredible place to work. And they would you know, believe you were coming for 40 years and train you and let you have management experience and you know, just really invested in, in you and me. Um, and then this thing called the internet started to bubble up, but HP was much more concerned with Y2K compliance. I was actually on the Y2K committee. But internet, not so much. And so I, I resigned after four or five years at HP to start an internet consulting practice. My family were horrified. Um, this internet thing was a flash in the pan, wasn't going to go anywhere. And started consulting to startups and to VCs out here in Silicon Valley, pitching myself as their international expansion consultant. And a year into that practice, got a phone call from a former colleague saying, hey, I'm at a heart startup. We're thinking of launching internationally. We'd like you to think about joining us and launching the business in Canada. And that was eBay. Um, and so I was with eBay for a number of years, got a big promotion, moved out here 15 years ago. I was at Yahoo running a bunch of divisions, and then I ran a public company. Um, and then I retired until I found my passion, which is around yoga and fitness and meditation, and started a company to bring subscription-based video so that you didn't have to go to the gym or the yoga studio to practice what you love. Happy to be here. Can't wait to talk about how to like, get what you deserve. And more. And more. Aditi. Hi, good morning, everyone. So my name is Dr. Aditi Banerjee, and I work for Infosys Consulting Services. Um, I started my career at Texas Instruments, about, uh, worked there for about 17 years. Um, it was uh, starting in R&D with development of the, one of the most advanced uh, memory and logic integrated circuits. Um, I was in the technical track, writing a lot of patents and papers, working with the most brilliant minds in the industry. It was a great exposure, but I soon realized that I have gifts which are beyond just writing code or designing. Uh, and uh, I want to be the full person that I am and bring it to work. So I moved into marketing. And uh, I was heading global marketing for Texas Instruments and power management products. Um, Did you bring us in that? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I was. Uh, heading global marketing, and then I was heading a business unit at TI. I got headhunted out of there to uh, run the semiconductor engineering services business for Infosys Consulting. It was, a, it was a major shift in my career because I was working in product, and here I have moved into services. And it has been an amazing growth opportunity for me to learn about services, which is a very, very wide field, um, right from digital technology to, uh, to engineering to SAP and many other variety of products. Um, so um, that's where I am right now. I'm in Infosys Consulting, and I had multiple verticals in R&D services, uh, including healthcare, life sciences, railroad engineering, and, and a few others. So I'm really happy to be here. Uh, the way my, uh, I got interested in STEM is because my parents were very encouraging to study engineering and mathematics, which I also was very gifted to have those, those kind of uh, skill sets and passion for. So I pursued that, and um, I finished up my doctorate here in, in the United States. So happy to be here. Thank you very much. As you can tell, we have a very distinguished list of people here, executives in the STEM area. You know, we've, we've seen all the data, all of us. There's not enough women in STEM, or if they enter it into college, the number of women who are graduating with STEM-related um, degrees is not progressing. In fact, at some universities, it's actually um, lower than a couple of years ago. But let's take it up close and personal. Let's talk about what some of these ladies in their own personal career have experienced. At the beginning, I talked about perceived and actual barriers and perceptions. So I, what I'd like to do is ask the ladies, think back on your career. What are some of the good and bad 
perceived and actual barriers that you had to address, and what did you do about it? Uh, I think uh, one of the barriers we, as a woman, we are all facing is the unconditioned, uh, un unconscious bias mm -hmm. we are facing. So unconscious bias can cause unintentional consequences. I think our society has long imposed uh, about the ideas, boys, they are supposed to be better than girls in terms of science, mathematics. And uh, men, they are better in the STEM fields as a leader compared to women. So this kind of unconscious bi bias is everywhere, I think, in our workforce. So this is one of the barriers uh, we are all facing. Uh, I think uh, we need to really, what we can do about that, it's not uh, one person's ability to make the change of this kind of impression our society has. We need to leverage uh, the media and the government public, I think public relations to break through this kind of bias and bring the truth forward. So what is the truth? The truth is boys, uh, girls, they are as good as boys in science and mathematics, engineering, and medical fields. And men and boys, they are as good as nurturing and caring, caregiving. So the men need to be more ambitious at home and in the kitchen table. So um, I think we need to work together to make the change uh, in our workplace to uh, overcome the hurdles which produced from uh, the unconscious deep bias. Yeah, let's talk about, let's, let's get underneath the covers a little bit because maybe there's some examples you can give of where you perceive there was an actual or perceived bias or maybe think about this, what have you done differently in order to get ahead? Did you manage your personal brand better did you form certain relationships? Well, I think one of the most important things, I mean, for anyone who, who has ambitions to make it to the C-suite, by the way, reflect if you really want that, um, <laughs> is it's really hard to do it alone. And so you yeah. need mentors, uh, people who want you to do well and who are finding opportunities for you, who have your back. One of the questions that I asked at every job interview I've ever had to the hiring manager is, okay, who's my advocate if I take this job? Right. Um, so having people who really care about you, and I've been so fortunate to have both male and female mentors who were looking, actively looking for opportunities for me um, to grow in my role. So I think that's something that women um, need to do probably more than men because it's easier for the guys, frankly, than it is for us in the minority to do so. So you have to be very proactive about it. And I've talked to, I mentor a lot of women and some women feel it's a little disingenuous, right? I'm like, oh, well, I'm kind of asking for favors. Right. Or, no, you're just doing what everybody else is doing. Which is, you know, you get ahead by having people who have your back and if you do a good job, it makes them look smart. I think seeking those folks out, uh, putting yourself forth for those opportunities, and taking risks. Um, I think that it's not linear always to yep. get to your next role. And so figuring out, you know, who, if you know you want your CEO's job, then talking to your CEO. I did this with a few of my CEOs, sat down and said, you know, how did you get here? And understanding what were the competencies required and what I lacked in order to go and get the job experience so that I measured up on paper, not just by being like the smartest person in the room. That's not going to get you there. Good point. You know, so, so in some instances, maybe we've changed our behavior. Some instances, we've taken different jobs. I know, for example, in my area is um, I noticed I started accelerating in my career path when I was tied to performance metrics quantifiable performance metrics. So when they did a scorecard, when I worked for a top Fortune 10, when they did a scorecard, they couldn't tell if I was man or woman. That's all they saw was their profit, how the profit was accelerated. And, it, and that window of opportunity by being measured on a P&L actually helped some of us, like myself, in careers. But for the rest of you, have you had to change your behavior or change the kind of job and recalibrate says, instead of doing this kind of job, I'm going to go do this kind of job because it's a stepping stone to another job? 
Yeah, yeah I, do you have examples? I, I can give an example. Uh -huh. So I was in semiconductor R&D and manufacturing for almost uh, 10 years and in my career. And there's very few women in that space. Very few women. It was very hard to get up the ladder, right? Um, but I consciously made a decision that I was going to get into strategic marketing and the business field. So I took a step uh, for doing a project with one of the VPs of uh, strategy in one of the un business units, uh, which was uh, a project that I did in my own time. And um, it was an accelerated program. And at the end of six months, I got to present that to all the senior leaders of business, the project that I had done. And it, it was successful. It, uh, it was on wireless technologies. And I got a lot of exposure from that. Um, to the vice presidents of businesses um, that, um, you know, I, I, I could do something in strategic marketing. I, w I did it well and have an interest in that field. And then I got my next job to move into a business unit from manufacturing. So. Well, that's interesting to switch into the marketing area. And maybe that gave you a more comprehensive set of skills that you could then use to run business, as an yes, example? Yes, absolutely. So moving to marketing gave me a a whole lot of different exposure. It gave me exposure to clients, where I was meeting clients all the time. Yeah. It gave me exposure to global business environment, uh, not just in North America, but Asia, Europe, and Latin America. And um, uh, you know, it gave me exposure to how to launch products, how to differentiate your products from competition, and a whole bunch of strategies in marketing, which was very important for my next job, which was heading up a business unit. So uh, it was a stepping stone. Good. So let me ask you this other question. You know, I hear a lot, I know in my own personal situation and others, that, you know, they said, how did you get ahead? And I hear some of the women said, I had this particular individual who did this. And oftentimes, because the numbers are out there, it may be another man, because there's more men in executive position temporarily for now, right? <laughs> so if you think back, who is your superman or superwoman? who did something to you, to your career, that helped jettison and turbo turbocharge your career. And also on the flip side, is there a person that could have done something and didn't? And why do you think that person didn't? So let's look at people who could be your superman and superwoman in your life. Right? I see some of you nodding your heads. And those who actually were. So, Tell me a little bit about your careers and how, who do, who do you think of when you dream of said, oh, I'm glad, in addition to what I did, these other people helped me. Superman and unsuperman. Well, yeah, Jimmy, I think <clears throat> uh, to your point, uh, actually to- Or superwoman. Uh, Lorna, uh, Lorna's point, uh, women, women we, in order to be successful, we need to have mentors and sponsors. That's kind of sponsors. Uh, we need to have sponsors. They can take chance on you and open up new opportunities. I think for me, my personal example would be uh, after my, I know after my MBA, I education, I know I want to be in the general management function of our business. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so because the gen in order to be successful in general management role, you have to understand multiple functions of a business. You have to understand you can you have to be able to lead R and D, marketing, yeah. finance, manufacturers. So, um, I because I understand my goal, so I try to get into uh, my company's uh, global leadership program. So, this program provides us a sponsor, mm -hmm. an executive mentor, so they, and so they understand our potentials, try to help us to advance our career by giving us uh, very high visibility projects, high visibility roles. So I think this kind of sponsor, uh, sponsor we have, um, for me, in my career, it's really help, it has been very helpful to for me to be able to have exposure I need yep. um, for you know, future success. So sponsor and mentor and sponsor, uh, Lorna just mentioned, is very key for women to be successful. And the reality is uh, women are not like men, they are, e they are much easier to get, be able to get mentor and sponsors compared to women. This is the reality we are facing. So I was very fortunate to be able to in the global leadership 
development program, so I have the chance to be able to access senior leaders as my mentors and sponsors. So I hope you know every one of you in this audience to reach out to establish your own mentors, find your own mentors and sponsors to help you because this is super important for career growth. Yeah, I think it's a good point. Now, Lorna, as an example, you've been in a variety of different companies, eBay, Yahoo, your current company. Yeah. What's, give us a set of optics from your experience in regards to those who were Superman, Superwoman, and the stuff between the toes. Um, so, you know, to me, the, the biggest lesson is you are always networking, always. Yep. And, you know, the supercharged person, I've had a few, but like when I, you know, after um, I was running a multi billion dollar division right. of eBay, it was time, it just felt, I wasn't, I wasn't going to be Meg, Meg Whitman, our CEO. I wasn't going to be her successor. That was kind of obvious. So it was time for me to go do something else. And so I reached out to Meg and I sat down with her and I said, yeah, I think it's time for me to go. Let's talk about it. How can you help me? And she was unbelievable. She literally, she had a Rolodex back then opened up her Rolodex and we made a list of all the people she wanted to introduce me to because my ambition then was to be the CEO you know, uh, of a certain scale of company. And so first she an helped me analyze what my strengths were, what my weaknesses were, and what I was missing. Mm -hmm. So it was almost like when you were talking about she meant objective metrics, right. saying objectively, Lorna, you've run several large businesses, you've done product management, you've done marketing, right. but you have to show that you can do this internationally and you have to show that you can manage engineering at scale. You're missing those two things. Um, and so I needed a global P&L where I had engineering squarely under me, where it was a growth business. And anyhow, she went ahead and introduced me to everybody from Eric Schmidt at Google to Scott Cook right. and Intuit. I mean, you name it. And, I'm, and about 30, 40 people she introduced me to, I ended up going to Yahoo. Um, but the key was those relationships, well, that public company that I went to run, it was because... John Doerr, who's a very famous venture capitalist, who was on the board, and Fred Anderson, who'd been the CFO at Apple, who was on the board, and Roger McNamee, who's a pretty well-known private equity guy. Yep. They came after me because they had met me all those years before and said, we want you to come do this. Um, and so I think the, the thing is, the introductions, the networking you're doing now, it's not all to pay off now. It's going to pay off in the future. So, you know, I, I tell the younger folks, my millennials, I tell them always, the back you're stepping on today is the butt you're kissing tomorrow. Like, be nice. Yeah. <laughs> be nice to everyone. You, you, you never know. Right. What goes around comes around. And just, you, you know, you are there. And if you can do someone a favor, just do it. Pay it forward. And it all comes back. But it is, um, I, I think, Superman's are moment. Do good things, network out there, good things will come back at you. But know that you're always auditioning for something, you just don't know what. You know, that's a very important takeaway. If, if, I, if I'm in the audience like you guys and I'm thinking about what can I take away from this, uh, from this session that I can immediately use, I'm hearing conversations and very valid um, viewpoints about mentorship and sponsorship. When I talk to some of the people that I mentor and sponsor, or that have mentored and sponsored me, I actually make a clear differentiation. And a simplistic one might be something like that. Somebody who mentor will, and I'd like you guys to add to it, somebody who mentor will coach you. But somebody who sponsors you will not only, for example, coach you, they will make sure, like you gave the example, Lorna, that you get the job and the set of scope of responsibilities that you want. And the difference between, for example, mentoring and sponsorship, for example, if you're up for a particular job, they might give you some insight that you might not have otherwise gotten. Because a lot of the jobs, it's so competitive now. It's not only our hard uh, STEM skills, uh, core competencies, but it's also the fit, the chemistry, and those kind of things. Comments on the difference between mentorship and sponsorship, or do you see it as the same? I see a differentiation. But what about you ladies? I think they are different. Uh, mm -hmm. Jimmy, I agree with you. Because mentorship is more about give you mentors, give you advice, how you're going to uh, take next step, for example, to grow your career. Sponsorship is more like uh, someone, they can take a chance on you. Uh, they believe in you. And they open up a new opportunities for you. So I see they are actually different, but they are related. But in nature, they are different. 
So I think for us, we need to have both mentors and the sponsors in order to be successful. Yeah, one of the comments um, one of you ladies talked about, you know, sometimes, and you got to understand in some companies and, and some geographical entities, they want women in leadership position. Have you ever asked when you were considered for a job? We're going to move into the selfie part of the session, right? The, the intimate part, the uh, open up the kimono. Have you ever, when you were interviewing for a job, be considered for a job and, they, and you heard that they want a woman, ask them, why do they woman a woman? I wish. In this particular world? <laughs> I do, <laughs> definitely. I want to work for a company where uh, the CEO wants women in there in leadership positions. Otherwise, it's an uphill battle for us. Uh, only in board seats. I and mean, right now, I mean, if Hi. you have a pulse <laughs> and, and, and you're female, and you're like halfway decent, boards want you, public boards want you, that's like, you know, play that. Um, no, I have never been offered a job where they said they want a woman. Um, I look forward to more and more of that happening <laughs> over the years. Touche on that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to comment a little bit on this. I think uh, um, in other societies, step by step, we do, uh, for large uh, corporations, we do uh, start to realize the diversity is mm -hmm. one of the important factors for a company uh, to be successful. So I think some of the large uh, corporations um, has the uh, diversity and inclusion functions and mm -hmm. offices. Um, so uh, they want to have a balance between um, men and the women in terms of senior leadership roles. When they say there's unbalance there, they try to hire more women mm -hmm. into leadership roles. I think I, I see most of the time is this kind of situation push some of the hiring um, hiring managers to hire women right. into more senior leadership roles. So this is one of the situations. Uh, they want women, specifically want women um, to be in a You actually opened up an interesting, um, interesting point, kind of like the paradigm between men and women. Now, I've heard this thing. It says most women did not get in their positions by being soft. So the question I have of you ladies is, have you changed the way you act? Do men look at you differently? Because remember, your, all of y'all's careers are turbocharged. So give, me, give the audience a little bit insight on that. Um, there's a lot of research, a lot of data behind the preponderance of women in positions of leadership and, and qualities, characteristics that have been necessary. The top one is likability. Right. Um, and I don't think that it is any surprise that when you meet, you know, I think we're just charming. Um, <laughs> which is like there is something about being likable. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it is. It's back to your point about unconscious bias. It's there, and so yeah, you need to be really smart. You need to be very good at what you do. Um, you probably need to be pretty likable, and if not, like figure out how to be likable, how to connect with people on a I personal agree. On, on a personal level. I think that's real. It's important for men too, but it's particularly important for women. It's not fair, by the way. It sucks. But if you're trying to get ahead, it's to think about that. You know, I don't know what your um, tricks are. I have a whole bunch of tricks about how every time I meet someone for the first time, I write down a note about everything that we, I learned personally about them. So I'll have in my notes, it'll say, you know, wife is blank, children play soccer, hate lacrosse, mm -hmm. you know, born whatever. And then I try to use that. Um, to make a personal connection the next time I see that person. And it's not disingenuous, it's actually genuine, but you're trying to make that connection so they remember you the next time. What other street smarts? We're in an interesting area now. What other street smarts can we pass on, ladies? Lorna, you want to give another one? Yeah, I have so many. <laughs> um, so another, um, another one, so when I, my first corporate job was at Hewlett Packard and I had a woman boss and she's amazing. And we were at our first big corporate meeting and we met with the CEO who was Lou Platt at the time. And we're in this line, like receiving line, like at a wedding almost, and everyone's shaking hands and she reaches forward and she gives him a hug and a little kiss on the cheek. I was horrified. Yeah. <laughs> horrified. And afterwards I said, Georgia, you kissed him. <laughs> and she looked at me, and I was like all of 26 or 27 at the time. And she said, Lorna, how many hands did he shake tonight? <sighs> oh, 
so interesting. Lean, you know, into your femininity. As opposed, I, I, she didn't like French kiss him. <laughs> it was a little hug with a little kiss on the cheek. And so I am now, I am a hugger. I'm naturally a hugger. You so know, there's I, a connection there now. Absolutely. And when I interview Remembering. people, when I meet people for the first time, when we finish, I, I will say, I'm a hugger. And I'd say nine times out of 10, they want that hug. One time out of 10, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Going from there to the next level, so have we done anything, have you, you ladies done anything to own your personal brand image? And what, what are you doing? I think I want to build, um, build on the previous comments, Chen Mei, you, uh -huh. uh, you mentioned how we do differently in order to be successful. I think uh, women, we've, we face a battle within. So uh, we are not, um, most of some of the time, we underestimate our abilities. Um, we um, judge our performance lower than it actually is, but the men, they judge their performance better than it actually is. So we are less risk taking. We, uh, we do not feel comfortable all the time to advocate ours for ourselves, mm -hmm. and uh, we do not ask for promotion. So these are the things, um, I think there's the battles, these are the battles we need to, they're within, so we need to change our behaviors uh, step by step to be able to, uh, you know, become more confident about ourselves. So this is how we need to do differently from within to change the situation external. But managing your brand, I mean, one of the things that uh, I do a lot of in terms of managing, mm -hmm. and I've done this for years, is um, you know, pigeonhole yourself for other people. So I let people understand what you're great at. And be like, oh, and I will often make you know, a, a remark and I'll say, oh, well, you know, for me, if it's not about consumer behavior in digital media, you know, gosh, I don't know if I can help you that much. That's what I understand, how to get people, how to design products and then market products to consumers that they want it. And you're, you're, you're giving out what your brand is. You do that three, four times. People start to go, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, Lorna Borton, yeah, what she's really all about is this. Right. So you are, you know, really out there with your megaphone, but it's quiet, but it's clear about what you are. Um, and so you're not waiting for someone to define you. You're defining yourself at just like lesson one in brand management. I think we have to manage our own personal brands. You have to manage your personal brands and let people know what are you amazing at? What are you great? Why do they want you Absolutely. to talk about it? Well, let me segue into this. We're going to get into Q&A in about a minute and a half. What I want to do is a quick lightning rod. Can you give, um, go deep into yourself, right? Reveal yourself. Do a selfie to, for the audience, right? a nice intimate selfie to the audience, and give them some words of wisdom. 30 seconds, five or seven words, what are some of the key takeaways that they, could, they should learn from having listened to you ladies during this session? Words of wisdom. I'll, I'll start. So performance management, very important. You've got to be top notch in your performance in your job. Building relationships is number two. It's extremely important to keep building relationship with your internal and your external stakeholders. Uh, getting a very firm grip on strategy and finance in addition to your responsibilities is extremely important for women uh, to be competitive in the workplace. So those Lorda. are Happiness is not a reward at the end of a life well played. <laughs> um, you better be enjoying yourself all along the way. Um, and so whatever it is that you're passionate about, whatever it is about your working environment that you love, go toward that. You will shine and you will not um, be a bitter, unhappy <laughs> middle manager. Um, you know, that is bitter that their boss isn't as smart as they are. Um, I, I think you're already doing great, but really open up to that joy and your passion. I mean, I think it will really make you go a lot further. You know, I, I agree with it for myself. I want to make sure I define my own success and happiness. Think about it, because who else is going to do it unless you do it yourself and as best you can own and manage your career and have a plan. Words of wisdom. Yeah, I want to uh, use legendary Muhammad Ali's words uh, for this. 
impossible is nothing. As a woman, we need to be bold on whatever we do, believe in ourselves, face up our challenges, and then we will, we will be successful at the end. And also to this audience here, I know many of you are executives. I ask, who will you mentor tomorrow? We need to start by helping each other to make this world brighter and better for all for women. You know, I heard uh, one of the um, prime ministers said, there's a special place for those women who don't help others. And I bet you guys can guess who it is. We have about 10 minutes for Q&A. I think we have a mic someplace. There we go. So what questions can we ask? This is our, this is our opportunity to really ask whatever we want to of these ladies. And thank you so much for courageous for being here. <laughs> thank sharing. you so much. Uh, great panels. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed your talk, Dr. Chairman, and uh, every panelist. For uh, Lorna, I use uh, Groker. I actually, uh, one, of the, one of the finalists, uh, her name is Sandra Augustin. She's my personal trainer. So I follow her back time and I follow your, all the clips. Awesome uh, clip. Way to go. Uh, yes. And uh, about uh, what you said, I, what I understood, so I know, that help you some to get at a level. So there was someone at the leadership level that saw something in you and help you identify like the strengths you have and help you develop an action plan and also help you to execute the plan for you. So I'm curious to know what took you, what was, what was the reason behind or how did you develop a relationship with her or with him, anyone that decision maker, because we need, that's the initial part of us to move on. Mm -hmm. How you develop a relationship, it, was it based on performance? Was it based on like you, because she or he liked you based on what a rock star employee you are, or with perception that people think, oh, she's really good on that. Yeah, Thank that's you. such a good question. Uh, number one is being, like I am, and I'm not being falsely self-deprecating when, when I say this. I mean, I, I am almost never the smartest person in the room. I am always the hardest working and the most curious. And I am so dependable. So anything that I am asked, by any superior at any point in time to do, not only will I do it, I will do it really well, really quickly, I will follow up and you will know that it's done and handled. I think that is the number one um, best advice in terms of impressing your superiors. Be so reliable right. and get it done, get it done quickly and let them know it's been done. So then the perception begins, I can trust her. Even if she doesn't do necessarily the smartest, the be it, it's going to be done. It's going to be 80 to 5, you know, 85% right. So number one is that reliability. And then the second thing is be human. I'll talk about yeah. my foibles, things with my kids, my husband, like just to be humans. They feel that it, you know, you're not an automaton, right? You're, you're, you're real. Um, but the, I think, the, but if you only had to do one, do the first. And you know, I'll add to it is surround yourself with really smart people. When you hire, don't be afraid, oh my gosh, that person is smarter than men, me and might take my job. Because what they're looking at you as an executive in the STEM area, be it medical research or whatever, is they're looking at the delivery of the team overall under your leadership. So ladies, you know, hire and gather the best team. Other questions we might have. Hi, uh, my name is Preetha, and I have a question for, I guess, all of you, and I'm hoping that you guys can sh throw some light on it. So uh, you guys mentioned that, you know, now that it's kind of a global economy, there's a lot of global business leadership that you're trying to demonstrate. So I have come across instances when um, I've been told that a lot of times when you're doing business meeting, especially in, in Asian cultures, uh, they prefer male instead of a female to deliver the message. I'm wondering if you guys have come across this, and if you have, how do you uh, prove yourself and you know, tackle that situation? Thank you. It's happened in me when I, many years when I was in Hong Kong, it, when it was under the British rule. And the, sometimes the way they conduct business, they will have the meeting, and then they go after, and the men have drinks, but that's where a lot of decisions are made. 
It happened um, a few years ago, actually, when I was in Japan and we were doing a product launch. And what they typically do, they not only eat late at night, a lot of us, Lorna, and a lot of us know that, and I was working for a top fortune company, is we were doing a product launch. And then afterwards, the, the men took off again for karaoke and all the other stuff, and they were out till one or two o'clock. But during the meetings, what we noticed that some of the questions were directed, even though I was a VP, they were directed to some of my team. So I did let my team uh, answer those questions. But then some of the questions, you needed a unique perspective of running the business on some of the experiences. So I chimed in on that way. I didn't go in and you know, usurp uh, some of the, uh, my team members. I let them speak. So everybody had a role. I think it's changed a lot in the last 10 years. Yeah. I mean, it has changed tremendously. I've faced so many situations. Not only that, blonde, blue-eyed, like, <laughs> good luck. I mean, it was not easy. You have to be OK with people um, kind of corporately dissing you. <laughs> You're just sort of like, if he's going to get the deal done, fine. Talk to him. He works for me. <laughs> you know, um, It's changed a lot recently, uh, tremendously. Some of the tricks, by the way, with all that drinking. Yep. Uh, so I, ever, I let people know that I'm a vodka drinker. And the bartender knows before I go in, I even have my assistant call, that when they bring me a drink, it's actually club soda. But they, yep. you guys all think it's vodka, so I can keep up drinking with the guys. I weigh half of what they weigh, right? I can't drink that much. Um, but I'm drinking with them, right? Yep. Um, I, you know, they, they used to go to strip clubs. I've been to strip clubs, right? Like you, you know, I used to play golf. I don't have to anymore, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think, you, you know, you just be aware of your audience. And at the end of the day, it's what, without falling out of integrity with yourself, you know, but, you know, what do you, I wasn't like sticking dollar bills, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> and they claim, they claim it's because they love the roast beef. Like, best roast beef ever. I'm a vegetarian. Um, but you, 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 know, you do what you need to do to get the deal done. So um, in the, that vodka trick really works super yep. well if you need to be pretending to drink. Yeah, I agree with them. And I'm sure all of us, you know, I, when Winnie asked us to speak, I said, I wanted to make sure the ladies and men who attended this session got some insight that they would have not gotten if they went and did something else. So this is the, the selfie part of it, the revealing part, the insightful part that I, I promised Witty we would deliver. Other comments? If not, I think we have time for one more question. One there. You want to wait for the mic just for a second, if you don't mind? Thank you. Thank you for the session. Um, so I used to be in corporate America and now work for a startup here in the Valley. When, a st when you're on the startup team, it's relatively small. So I'd like to think I'm very much in charge of my own success. But in terms of opportunities, there are a whole lot less, especially if you're in an organization that's like 30 people or less. What ideas or suggestions would you have for someone like myself who has kind of been through this in a different environment where you have actually systems and structures in place to find mentors or to find sponsors. Yeah. Good comment. Go ahead. Yeah, I think one of the things uh, I would suggest, although you work at a startup, but uh, you can involve in lots of uh, um, uh, societies, right. for example, Association for Women in Science. Uh, you know, they have lots of members have similar um, background, maybe similar work environment with you. You can uh, have mentors and sponsors get you can get from those societies, Women in Technology International, we mm -hmm. here. And so involving lots of different societies in your field. And so and also, I think if you uh, can spend your time volunteering uh, in those different societies and the courses, you will find you know, lots of mentors. Because I have mentors both from within, within my organization and also outside of my organizations. Lots of mentors, I got to know them because you know, the societies are involved in by volunteering. Um, you know, these kind of activities is really uh, helpful. Uh, I think uh, my understanding is I involve in lots of uh, activities in Association for Women in Science. They provide, uh, you know, people, um, women uh, with mentorship. They have mentorship programs. So these are the ways you can find mentors outside of your uh, startup uh, uh, organization. 
I agree. At the beginning, I thank Witty for taking such a leadership role in promoting women in the advancement. It's the oldest and largest international organization. And I wanted to thank each and every one of you because you're taking charge, you're turbocharging your own career by being here. And I know when you go back, the stack of to-dos is still going to be there. So I wanted to thank you for that. And most especially, I wanted to thank both Lorna, Chinga, and Adida for sharing their perspectives. And I hope you all have a really, um, for the rest of the session, you network, you get out there, you have some great takeaways. So thank you so very much on behalf of all of us. Chi Bolin signing off.